Take, it takes time off your license, the, the required amount of work experience. Uh, it takes typically four years from your degree towards your PE. If you get a master's, that takes one year off. If you get your PhD, it takes another year off. So I'm actually planning on taking my PE in April. So what? Research and teaching can count, but it, it, you have to meet certain requirements. So I, I turned the display on. Okay, this is a little strange. Um, the, all right, let's, let's get started. Um, for some reason, the TV isn't working. Is anybody in the class beforehand? Were there issues with the TV? Because it, it, there's like a little red. All right, let me, all right, let's, let's try that. What's that? Yeah, I'm <laughs> hey, I'm going to be doing some mixing today, some concrete mixing, so I dress down, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, uh, let me get the lights adjusted. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, okay, so um, a couple things. we got to get through some announcements, and then I want to get through our comprehensive mix design uh, example today. So uh, your homework for... Remember, that's due on Tuesday, October 17th. Um, today, we're going to do a mixed design example, uh, start to finish. And I think that mixed design example will essentially cover uh, a lot of the broad strokes of what you're going to be doing on your homework assignment. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think there's four problems on your homework assignment. The first three are essentially pieces of the mixed design process. And then the fourth problem is a full-blown start to finish mixed design. So, uh, and like I said, concrete mix design is one of the, 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 the seminal skills that uh, you all need to derive, not just from this class, but it's one of those skills that as a civil engineer you need to understand. This is a really important lecture today. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, uh, just so you all are aware, we are canceling class on Tuesday. Uh, Thursday, we will come back, we will talk about some more properties associated with Portland cement, you know, place or Portland cement concrete uh, placement, mixing, you know, uh, how to properly uh, handle concrete uh, in the field. Um, and then in our lab, we will do our first full-blown mix design. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the. Uh, basically, today I'm going to be doing a demo for you, and I'm going to be showing you uh, the process, start to finish, for doing. Uh, uh, the concrete mix design lab, and, and I think this is going to be pretty valuable because, you know, I mean, once you start mixing concrete, you only have so much time to, you know, do all of your uh, uh, experiments, get all the data, and then uh, cast all your samples. So, having a, a good and thorough understanding of what's going on, uh, I think that's going to be pretty important. Uh, any questions before we get right into our mix design example? Okay. Does every uh, before we get into the example, does everybody have your handout with you? The the PC or the PCC mixed design procedures. I'm going to steal this from you. We're talking about this one. Remember the one that had the step one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Does everybody have that? You're going to want to have that out uh, as we do this example. So, okay. All right. So really quickly, let me briefly, very briefly, go over the target of the mixed design that we're doing today. So we're going to be determining the mix design proportions for a batch of concrete uh, that's going to be used in a bridge deck. So we're talking about uh, a concrete that's going to be used in an exterior application. It's going to be subjected to freeze-thaw cycles, uh, de-icing salt sulfates. So air and trainer is definitely going to be used for this. Uh, our minimum dimensions, we're going to need this for, for uh, checking our aggregate that we're using. Uh, the minimum dimension is 9 inches, so it's at a minimum 9 inches thick. Um, our cover and, and bar spacing are two and a half inches, so we'll use that to check and see whether or not the aggregate that we're using is appropriate. Uh, we're going to uh, try and achieve a target compressive strength of 4,000 PSI. So remember, the, the structural engineer who designed this bridge deck was assuming a compressive strength of 4,000 PSI. Our job as the uh, mix designers are to ensure that we are achieving 4,000 PSI. So our required compressive strength is going to be a little bit larger than that. 
Um, we're going to assume a standard deviation of 400 psi, and we're going to assume that our testing uh, will include tests. Uh, will will uh, will test over 30 samples. Um, the next slide, we have all of our properties associated with coarse aggregates. Hopefully, by now, you all have a, a, a little bit more of an appreciation for how to obtain these values, how to obtain the moisture content, the absorption, uh, specific gravity, so on and so forth. Uh, just, uh, and I mentioned this last time, if you look at the moisture content as, uh, as opposed to the absorption, you will see that both of these aggregates contain excess moisture. So when it's all said and done and we do our moisture correction at the end, what you'll find is we're actually going to decrease the amount of moisture that we, uh, or the amount of water that we throw into the mix. Sound good? Okay. So let's just get into it. Let's just take it one step at a time and let's get into this uh, mix design. Remember when it's all said and done, what we're after is we're after how much coarse aggregate we need, you know, how many pounds of coarse aggregate, how many pounds of fine aggregate, how many pounds of cement, how many pounds of water, and how many pounds, or how much uh, of any admixture, how much of those weights do we need to achieve one cubic yard, okay? So that ultimately, that will be the answer is our, uh, is our proportions. All right. Okay, give me one second. Okay, so I'm using this handout just, and I'm just going to go down it, you know, step by step, okay? So our step one, see if everybody's paying attention, what's going to be step one? Determine the required compressive strength. So there we go. So uh, where'd the pen go? Uh, I had it there. So, oh, there it is. It walked away from me. Okay, so... PCC mix design. Okay, so step one. And step one is to determine the required compressive strength. Okay, remember uh, ACI states that we can design a mix with an assumed risk of 10%. Remember we can assume that 10% of the samples are going to fall below our, uh, our target FC prime. So our required FC prime, F FCR prime, is going to be a little larger than that. So let me ask you a question. Um, let's see if, if everybody remembers this. Okay, so if we go off of step one, the first thing we need to determine is how many samples are we going to test and how many are we going to test according to our example? Over 30. So I will say this. So we'll say that N is greater than 30. Okay. And our standard deviation, is it Greater than or less than 500 PSI? Less than. So our standard deviation is less than 500 PSI. Therefore, you tell me, how am I going to compute FCR, FCR prime? F, uh, FC prime plus 1.34S. Does everybody see that? Okay. So FC prime plus 1.34 times the standard deviation. So that is uh, 4,000 PSI, right? That's our target, plus 1.34. And what's our standard deviation? 400. So what do, what do we get? Four, five, thirty-six. Forty-five, thirty-six what? PSI. All right, do I have a second on that value? All right. Step one's done. That was easy, right? I need the button. That was easy. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right, so step two. Step two, our next step, is to determine our water cement ratio. Okay, so this is going to be the ratio of how much water we throw into the mix versus how much cement we throw into the mix. And in order to do that, we need to determine our required compressive strength. I mean, the water cement ratio, if you recall, that's one of the most critical parameters that affects the strength of a given batch of concrete. So 
Uh, just to recap so that everybody remembers this, uh, you know, and, and what I like to do for each of these steps is I like to um, repeat all the relevant information. So in, you know, just looking at step two to determine uh, the water cement ratio, I'm going to need to know, first off, um, I'm going to need to know FCR, which I just computed, FCR prime. So that is 45, 36. Okay. Whoop. All right. Okay. What else are we going to need to know? We know F, uh, FCR. What else? You tell me. Whether it's air and trained or not. Okay. Is this air and trained concrete? Yes, it is. This is an exterior application, so definitely it is going to be air and trained. So we know uh, F prime CR. We know it's air and trained. Okay. <coughs> All right. What else? You tell me. We know, we know it's air and train. We know FCR. Look at the table below. What else are we missing? We're, we're talking about its exposure condition, right? This is a bridge deck. So I propose that um, this is going to be exposed to freeze-thaw. It's going to be exposed to de-icing salts. Okay. What about the table on the next page? Sulfate exposure. Anybody remember what the sulfate exposure for this is going to be? We had that listed. Anybody remember that? What's okay? How about this. What I'm getting at is we are going to assume severe exposure, okay? So what I'm going to say is oops, severe oops, severe exposure to sulfates. Oh, getting ahead of myself. Everybody okay with this? I think it's pretty important for each step to say, okay, what do I need in order to progress with this step? Okay? So what we're essentially doing in this so that everybody's clear, we're using table one to determine what our water cement ratio would be, but we're checking that against the limits that are provided in table seven three and table seven four. Now let's take a look at table seven one. Okay? So Table 7-1, here, I'll tell you what I, what I ought to do. I ought to pull the handout out. I don't know. Okay. Okay, so here's our required compressive strength. Okay, so here's table 7-1. Okay, so based on a... Uh, water, or based on a compressive strength, a required compressive strength, and whether or not we're air entrained or not, we can determine uh, a water cement ratio. Now the problem is, um, what was FCR? It was like 4,500 something, right? Okay, so we're dealing with air entrained concrete. Now for 4,000 psi, we have a, uh, a water cement ratio of 0.48. For 5,000 psi, we have 0 0.40. So you tell me, what should we use? Linear interpolation, but I mean, we're talking, I mean, it's 4,500, it's basically in the middle, so if we're at 0 0.48 and 0 0.40, 0 0.44, okay. So we will say, therefore, so according to table 7 1, the water cement ratio is 0 0.44. And again, your water cement ratio should be somewhere between 0.44 and 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is getting kind of high, but um, uh, just something to keep in mind. Now, let's look at the next table, table 7-3, or table 7.3. Okay, so based on this table, you tell me... Oh, oh goodness. Okay, so based on table 7.3, you tell me... Um, what is our, uh, what is the water cement ratio that is being specified in table 7-3? 0.4. 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. 0 
0.45, we're talking about concrete exposed to freeze, uh, freeze thawing and moist condition for de-icers. Now, this 0.45, is that, uh, what is that? Minimum, uh, maximum, okay? So, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say that our, according to Table 7.3, our maximum water cement ratio is 0 0.45. Four five, okay. Everybody okay with that? All right. Table seven point four Okay. So you tell me, so based on table uh, seven four, what do we got going on? Based on severe exposure to sulfates, our maximum water cement ratio is 0 0.45. Does everybody see that? Okay. So, again, WC max, bless you, is... Okay. So, remember... Throwing excess water into a, a, uh, a given mix is going to result in lower strength, okay? So at this point in our mix design, we want to try and use the lowest water cement ratio that we can. So I propose that right now we use a water cement ratio of 0.44. Now again, remember, this has in no way, shape, or form been corrected for moisture content. We're going to do that down the line. But the long and short of it is our target uh, water cement ratio is going to be 0.44 for now. Yes, sir? Yes. 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 Exactly. You're exactly right. You are going to look at all three. Because the first one is really our, um, if, if all we were caring about was compressive strength, Table 7-1, if all we cared about was compressive strength, Table 7-1 would be the only one that we need to look at. But Table 7-3 and Table 7-4 are trying to bring a little bit of reality into the mix. And if you're uh, exposed to uh, freeze thaw or sulfates or something like that, then you're going to have limits. So, so, yeah. And usually what you'll find is it's going to drop it down a little bit. That's a good question, though. Exactly. If, if it had been very severe, we'd be using 0.4 because that would have been our maximum and that would have been the stringent, that would have been the limit. And ultimately what would have happened is we would have uh, generated a mix that when it was all said and done ended up having a higher compressive strength than is necessary. So we would have been erring on the side of caution. Yes. But, you know, it's a trade-off. If you've got a, a concrete mix that's going to be used in brackish water, well, you know, it's a trade-off. So, make sense? Okay. All right. Okay, let me see. Can I fit this on this panel? Uh, probably not. I'm going to conserve some space. Everybody got this? Okay. What's that? Oh, hold on. What's that? Oh, okay. So basically what that, and that's a good point. I, I, I did sort of uh, skip past that. Basically what that is saying is based on a given c exposure condition, we have a, at least very minimum compressive strengths that we have to meet. And I guess I didn't, even, I didn't even bring that up. Let me actually, let me look at that. Fortunately for us, it doesn't really matter. But, um, So the question was on table three, what's going on over here? Fortunately for us, we were fine because what we were looking at is our, oh, okay, I, okay. This right here, it, it's, re, it's, it's, it's referring to the FCR. The, there are some typos, so I, and I apologize for that. Um, one of the things you're going to find, and it's not just here, but it's, it's in the textbook. If you look at these tables in the textbook, like, uh, for instance, let, let me pull something up. Um, let me see. Okay, all right. If you look at some of these tables in the textbook, see how it says nominal maximum aggregate size? In the textbook, it says maximum aggregate size, and that can get a little confusing. This is actually off the digital copy, and for the most part, it's correct. But, yeah, that's, that's a typo. So 
what this really should be referring to is the FCR and ultimately for us we're fine. So. But that's a good point though. If we found that we would have had a limit, what we would have had to do is gone back to step one and then do it, do like one more iteration. That, that's a good point though. Is everybody kind of getting what he's asking? So our FCR is 4536, so, so we're good. Everybody okay with this? What's that? Exactly, exactly. But yeah, if you look in the book, I think there's a few of them, there's a few tables that, that could use a little bit of work. So It's a work in progress. So. Everybody good? All right. Okay, uh, I am going to, go. Uh, if you all have this, I'm going to go ahead to the next panel and say continued and look at step three. Okay, so in step three, what we're doing, again, just so everybody's clear on what we're doing, we're taking our fundamental pieces of information associated with the beginning of the design, and we're determining weights for most of the ingredients. So weight of coarse aggregate, weight of water, et cetera. Later on, we're going to do a, a volumetric approach and figure out how much fine aggregate we need in order to achieve a given volume. So just, just so everybody's aware, we are ultimately going to be designing this to achieve a given volume, but that's what we'll see uh, down the line. Okay, now, in step three, we are going to be determining the weight of the coarse aggregate. So I'm going to call step three coarse aggregate. Or gravel. But while we're at it, what we also need to determine is whether or not the coarse aggregate that we are using is appropriate for this application. Okay. Now I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Bless you. Okay. Does anybody remember what the nominal maximum aggregate size was for this aggregate? One inch. So this is one inch nominal maximum aggregate size. Okay, now help me out. If we have a one inch nominal maximum aggregate size, what is the maximum aggregate size? One and a half. Now how did you determine that? And one sieve up, and what's right there on the sheet? All, all the standard sieves. So one inch nominal max size leads to a one and a half inch maximum aggregate size. Okay? And the reason why that is important is because we are going to use maximum aggregate size to assess clearance requirements. Okay, clearance requirements. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to look at the form. Now, according to this table, uh, for form dimensions, what is the maximum allowable uh, aggregate size? No, 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 no. No, I'm talking about this. What's, what's that? No, 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 I'm talking about the, for the form. One fifth, yeah, okay. So for, for the form, uh, our maximum ag allowable aggregate size is one fifth of our minimum clear distance. Now, what is our minimum clear distance for this, uh, for this uh, element going to be? No. We're talking about essentially the, the entire element. We're not talking about space between each bar or between the bar. It's nine inches, okay? The other two requirements that you see down here are the, the clear space between reinforcement and the clear space between the reinforcement and the form. Those are the cover requirements that you're used to, especially if you've taken reinforced concrete design. What we're talking about is, you know, for instance, if we're designing a beam, our form distance would literally just be the width of the beam. The cover requirement would be, well, how far is the rebar from each other, how far is the rebar from the edge? Do you see what I mean? 
So if I had a beam, here, to give you kind of an idea of what we're checking here, let's say I have a, okay, let's, let's just look at this. Let's say I have a slab that's nine inches thick. Can I use aggregate that's six inches in diameter? That's a pretty big stone for a nine inch thick slab. So there are at least some maximum allowable limits just based on minimum thickness of the, uh, of the element. Th does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I can understand. And, and, that, and that's where the, the, the next two come in. I, I, but we're going to get to that here in a second, though, because we're, we're going to check uh, all, like all three of these. The only one we're not going to check is an unreinforced slab because we don't need to. It is reinforced. You, you see what I mean? Everybody else okay with this? This is good stuff. Please, if you've got any questions, this is where you want to ask. All right. So, oh. okay, what is one-fifth of nine inches? 1.8 inches. So I propose that if you've got a nine-inch thick slab, the maximum aggregate size that you can use is 1.8 inches. Are we okay to use this aggregate? Yeah, because the aggregate has a maximum size of one and a half. It's less than our, than our limit. Everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. Now, let's look at the next one. Okay, the next one is clear space between reinforcements. So the difference between the second row and the third row is clear space between individual bars, between one bar and another. The third row is the space between the bar and the edge of the form. Does that make sense? So what we've got is we've got, you know, let's say, you know, here's our slab, okay? This dimension is our thickness, and this is nine inches. And let's say we've got, you know, let's say, you know, we've got some bars here and some bars here, and I'm just highlighting a couple of them. What we're saying is that this distance right here, what is this distance for our slab, and what is this distance for our slab? They're both 2.5 inches. Okay, so let me ask you this. These two values are 2.5 inches. Would it make sense to use aggregate with a maximum size of four inches? No, it's gotta be able to fit in between there, okay? So what's the limit? What's gonna be the limit for these two? It's gonna be three quarters, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. So, what I'm saying is that based on bar spacing, we have three quarters of two and a half inches. And for clear spacing, whoop, we have three quarters of two and a half inches. And that's the same count just because those dimensions just happen to be the same. What does that yield? Okay, so we'll just say something like 1.9. Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. So, based on these, is our aggregate okay? Yes. All of these values are greater than or equal to 1.5 inches, so we're okay. Okay. Now, that still doesn't tell us how much coarse aggregate we can use. We still have to determine that, okay? So, let's look at, yes? Um, one of those values for less than 1.5 inches, would it be straight forward just going to that value? No, what, I mean, what we're looking at at this point is whether or not the aggregate that we're even using is appropriate. So let's say one of these limits were violated. The answer would be, find a different gravel. Yeah. No, I'm serious. That's what, that's what that would mean, so. Yeah, yeah. You, you you still have to meet this because I mean, I mean the the, I mean let's be clear. We're designing a mix for a given application, so the ultimate aggregate that we use has to work. Did, did I answer your question? Or? Yeah, that's going to be the one that controls. Yeah, we say we use the term govern or control. That's the one that governs. Yes. Does that make, did I answer your question? I did? Okay, all right. Okay. Now, 
we still need to determine the weight of coarse aggregate. Okay? So in order to do that, we need a, a couple things. First off, what is the unit weight of our coarse aggregate? You all remember that? Here, I'll pull this up. Here's our coarse aggregate. Our unit weight is 108 pounds per cubic foot. Okay? So I'm, first off, I'm going to write that out. So our, and I'll call this dry rotted, is 108 pounds per cubic foot. Okay? So that tells me how much uh, coarse aggregate occupies, or how, you know, how many pounds of coarse aggregate occupies one cubic foot. So you'd think, well, all I've got to do is multiply that by 27 to figure out how much coarse aggregate will occupy one cubic yard. And that is true. But the problem is there's not just coarse aggregate in our mix. There's also fine aggregate. There's also sand. Okay? So the amount of coarse aggregate that we're going to throw into this concrete mix, well, it's a function of how fine our sand is. So let me ask you this. Okay? What is our fineness modulus? 2.7. Okay. Now, I'm also just going to rewrite. We have one inch nominal maximum aggregate. And you'll see why I'm doing that here in a second. Let's look at our table. So let's look at table 7.5. Okay. Okay. So table 7.5 is basically, basically what table 7.5 is, is a reduction. It tells us how much we can reduce the amount of gravel we throw into our mix as a function of how fine our sand is. Okay. So what did we say our fineness modulus was? 2.7. What's our nominal maximum aggregate size? One inch. So one inch nominal maximum aggregate size. Okay, so here's a value for point, uh, 2.6. Here's a value for 2.8. What should we use? 0.68. Okay. All right. So, and, and I'm calling that value C sub S. Or you said 0 0.68, sorry. Is that right? Okay. So, I propose then, therefore, I propose that the weight of gravel that we would throw into one cubic yard is going to be the unit weight times this adjustment, but all that will tell us is how much gravel goes in a cubic foot. If I want how much goes into a cubic yard, I multiply this by 27 because there's 27 cubic feet in a cubic yard. You know, 3 times 3 times 3, 27. Okay, so that is 108 pounds per cubic foot. That's 0 0.68. And that is 27. Or We'll call this uh, what do we get? So right now, for a yard of concrete for this batch, we would need 1983 pounds. That's not going to be our final answer because we're going to do a moisture correction, okay? But right now, uh, that's going to be our initial uh, value. Everybody okay with this? Okay, all right. There we go. So, all right. All right. Everybody have this? Okay, all right. Let's look at step four. Okay, so what do we do in step four? Air entrainment.
Aaron Traman. Okay. <coughs> so, um, first off, if this was an interior column in a building, would we even need air entrainment? No, so we would just skip this, okay? But since we are dealing with an exterior application, we do have air entrainment requirements. So let's look at this. Um, are we gonna have mild, moderate, or severe exposure? Severe exposure, okay? So we'll say severe exposure, okay? What else? What's our nominal maximum aggregate size? One inch nominal max aggregate. All right. So you tell me, um, what's our percent air going to be for this mix? Six percent. Okay. Now that's by volume. Okay. So percent air is six percent. Or well, I guess I should. I guess I should be specific and say 6.0. That will become relevant here in a little bit. Okay? Everybody good so far? All right. Like I said, we're just taking it one step at a time and working out our ingredients. Okay. Step five. Step five is workability. So step five is looking at our slump. Okay, so you tell me, what's our range for, for this job going to be? What's our, our, what's our target range for slump? From a minimum to a maximum, you tell me. Okay, that's true, but that's also, that's in millimeters, so yeah, there we go. Make sure, that, and, and that's going to show up quite a bit, so make sure... For U.S. units, you're using the values in parentheses. So we're going to be using a slump anywhere from one to three inches. And, and I'm selecting that based on the fact, I mean, we're looking at a reinforced concrete deck, so we're looking at a slab. So for a slab, have a slump somewhere between one inches to three inches. Pretty simple. Right? Okay. Everybody good? All right. Now, step six is looking at water. Okay? So, what we're going to do is this. So, right now we're determining the weight of the water. Um, We've got the weight of the water, and then in step two, we determine the water-cement ratio. So we're going to take the weight of the water and the water-cement ratio on the next step to determine how much cement we throw into the mix. So then we'll have our coarse aggregate, our, you know, uh, our gravel. We'll have our cement, we'll have our water, and then we'll be able to do uh, some work. Okay, so let's look at, uh, at, at, at the weight of the water, okay? Um, we still have a one inch nominal maximum aggregate. Okay, one inch nominal maximum aggregate. We are dealing with an air and train mixture, right? Okay, so we've got a, uh, an air and train mixture, so you tell me. For table seven, eight, how much water we're going to do that here in a second. We're going to, you're exactly right. We are going to do that here in a second. But based on this, um, how much water should we throw into this mix? Now there's a little caveat there. First off, we're looking at air and train concrete, so we're looking at the lower section of the table, right? Okay. All right. We are also looking in the values inside the parentheses, not outside. But now we got a little bit of a problem, right? Our slump range is one to three inches, right? And we've got values from one to two and three to four. Anybody remember what we do here? Take a larger one. We generally desire larger workability. So 
for three to four inch slumps with a nominal maximum aggregate size of one inch for air and train concrete, how much water should we throw into this mix? 295, and that's 295 pounds per cubic yard. Everybody okay with this? Now, Mr. Adams brought up a good point, okay? This table lists required weights of water for angular aggregate, okay? Are we dealing with angular aggregate in this problem? What are we dealing with? That's Huffman calling me. You think he'd know where I was at? <laughs> What's that? Well, it's not live streaming or anything. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay. So for subangular aggregate, what are we going to uh, reduce by? Remember, angular aggregate is among the least workable aggregate there is, okay? If you take two identical mixes, one with angular aggregate and one with rounded aggregate, I promise you the one with rounded aggregate is going to be much more workable. So because we have a, a little bit of rounding on our aggregate, we're going to reduce by 20, yard, or 20 uh, pounds per cubic yard. So therefore, the weight of water that we're going to use right now is 275. Is everybody okay with this? Any questions so far? Okay, so we've got our weight of gravel, our weight of water, we've got all of our target air entrainment and all that. What we've now got to find is the weight of the cement. Okay? All right, I can fit this here. Okay. Now, refresh my memory. What was the water cement ratio that we came up with? 0 0.44. All right. What is the weight of the water that we just came up with? Oh, that's cubic yards, sorry. That's another thing. I do want to see units on this stuff. That matters. Okay. So therefore, the weight of cement that we would need for this is the weight of the water divided by our water cement ratio. So that is 275 pounds per cubic yard divided by 0 0.44. What does that come out to be? 625. I would ask for a second, but I had a lot of people say 625 together. Okay. All right, everybody good? Okay. <clears throat> now, what we are also going to need to do is check against minimum weights, okay? So, based on different applications, regardless of what you calculate for your water-cement ratios, there are minimum amounts of uh, uh, cement that you need to include. Do we have an underwater application? I hope this bridge deck isn't underwater. I would hope so. <laughs> so, <laughs> so limits. Yeah, that's yeah, a little bit past that. We got more problems in the mix design, though, if we got that. Okay, so our PCA minimum for severe 
exposure. We do need to check this one, but this one is 564. We good here? Yeah, we're good here. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh okay. What? It's checking the minimum for severe is severe exposure right here. I, I just, I'm literally just rewriting that. So, is it, everybody okay with that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Now we also need to check minimum requirements for use in flat work, which would definitely definitely be applicable for this since we're talking about a large flat element that's being cast. It's a bridge deck. So based on our nominal maximum aggregate size of one inch, what's our limit on cementing materials? 520. So this one isn't usually too big of a deal, but worth checking. So, so I'll say for flat work. one inch nominal max aggregate and that is uh, 520. Okay, so that means that the weight that we computed earlier is going to be applicable. One other thing that's worth pointing out, when we do moisture corrections, we're going to be doing moisture corrections to change, you know, ultimately the amount of water that we throw into the mix and the amount of aggregate. But one thing it won't change is this, okay? So for our mix design, 625 pounds per cubic yard, that is going to be our proportion at the end. So just something to think about. Okay, everybody got this? Do I need to leave this up here for a second? Okay. Okay, step eight. Okay, so let me explain how this works so, so that everybody's aware. Okay, now, so what we're determining is admixtures in step eight. And the units are a little funky, but all, I mean, they look a little funky, but all in all, they're, they're, they're pretty simple. Okay, now let me pull up, I'm going to pull up the slideshow for this because this is one up probably don't expect you to remember. Okay. So for this air and trainer, okay, what this is stating is that 0.1 fluid ounces of this air and trainer will produce 1% air for every 100 pounds of cement. Everybody see that right here? Okay, so let me pull this, let me let me sort of mess that a little bit. Okay. So our rate is 0 0.1 ounces per that will generate 1% air for 100 pounds all right max on slash 100 pounds of cement okay now let me ask you this what was our percent air 6% Okay, so let me explain what that means. Okay, so 0.1 fluid ounces will generate 1% air for every 100 pounds. So I propose that 0.6 fluid ounces will generate 6% air, but only for every 100 pounds of cement. How much cement do we have? 625. Okay, so our weight of cement is 625. So, to determine the volume of our admixture, I propose that we take 0 0.1, okay, so 0 0.1 ounces, and I'll say over, you know, 1% air, times 6% air, 
times the following. Okay. Now that will generate 6% error for every 100 pounds. Well, we have 625 pounds. So I propose divide. Make sense? In other words, if we, you know, 0.1 times 6 will tell us how much we need for 100 pounds. If we had 200 pounds, we just double it. If we had 300 pounds, we triple it. Well, we have 625 pounds. So I propose we need to multiply it by 6.25. Does that make sense? So what does that tell us? Uh, okay, I got 3.75. No, yeah, it's just, it's just times 6. It should just be 0 0.1 times 6 times 6.25. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's 3.75 fluid ounces per cubic yard, okay? So, and remember, an admixture, it's, it's a liquid, so you just measure out however many fluid ounces you need per cubic yard and throw it into the mix. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? All right. Okay. If that's the case, then now we can do our volumetric approach to determine the fine aggregate. So fine aggregate. Or the sand. Okay. Now, I provided you all a little table and some guides to sort of go along with this. So I'm going to kind of go along with this table. Now, note that what we're doing is we're doing this for one cubic yard. So I'm going to leave sort of the pounds per cubic yard off and just deal with pounds since we're looking at one cubic yard. So ingredient. Okay, so let's look at water. How many pounds of water are we throwing into one cubic yard? Two seventy-five. Okay. Now, water has a specific gravity of one. So, what is the volume of water? Okay. Now, in order to do that, all you're doing is you're taking the weight divided by the specific gravity times the unit weight of water. And I've got the unit weight of water right here. It's just 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So since we're using 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, whatever volume we calculate is going to be in cubic feet. Okay, so somebody tell me what that's going to be. 4.41. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, cement. How much cement are we throwing into the mix? 625. The specific gravity of Portland cement is always 3.15. So how much volume will that occupy? 3.18. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Gravel. Now, this is where you got to start looking stuff up. How much gravel are we throwing into the mix? 1982.88. Okay. So we'll say 1982.88. Specific gravity. Does anybody, did anybody write down what the specific gravity of this gravel is? 2.665, is that what you said? So how much volume does that occupy? 
Yeah, that was one of the given pieces of information. All. Yeah, right here. That was just given. Say it again. What you got? 11.9. Is it zero? Nine two. Eleven point nine two. Okay. Now, obviously, there's sand that goes into the mix, but there is one more ingredient that generates volume. And that's what's that? The admixture, air, essentially. Now, air, obviously, it doesn't have a weight. Okay. So, the way that we're going to determine that is we're just going to take 27 pounds or 27 cubic feet. We say, okay, in one cubic yard, there's 27 cubic feet. How much percent of that volume is air? 6%. So, what's 27 times 6%? Say it again. 1.62. So all I did here is just 6% of 27. That's it. So you know, nothing, we don't need anything here or here. That's it. Sound good? OK. Sum up these volumes. Tell me how much volume is that? 21.13. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So that's 21.13 pounds per cubic foot. Okay. Now, um, one cubic yard contains 27 cubic feet. I said pounds per cubic feet. That's 21.13 cubic feet. One cubic yard is 27. So how do we determine how much fine aggregate needs to go into this mix? 27 minus this. So that's going to be the volume of fine aggregate. So therefore, and I'll call it the volume of sand, is 27 cubic feet minus 21.13 cubic feet. And that yields what? 5.87 cubic feet. Now, in, in order to determine an amount, we need to determine the weight, okay? Because what they're going to do, they're going to weigh how much sand they need, and that's going to go into the mix. So if I have a volume, how do I determine the weight? I just use this and multiply over. So therefore, the weight of the sand is the volume of the sand times the specific gravity times the unit weight of water. So that's 5.87 cubic feet times, anybody remember what the specific gravity of this sand is? 2.599 times 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Now remember, this is all how much would go in one cubic yard. So the per cubic yard is sort of implied. Okay, and what does that yield? So 951.98, did you say? I have a second on that? Okay, so 951.98 pounds. And I'll say, I'll say this is pounds per cubic yard. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Rem all right, that's that's a good that's a good question. Okay, remember all of these these weights here. These are all how many pounds would go in one cubic yard. So this entire, you know, step nine is looking at one cubic yard. Okay, with that. Okay. So would you agree this right here is how much sand we need to throw into the mix to generate one full cubic yard? Would you agree with that? Okay. All I did here is just convert that into a weight. So the cubic feet cancel and I get pounds. But what I'm saying is that that amount, that weight, is how much sand you need to throw into it to generate one cubic yard. So the per cubic yard was really everywhere in all this. I just didn't want it to get superfluous. So, does that make sense? Everybody good? OK. So the only thing left to do at the very end is to do a moisture correction, okay? Because remember, this 
gravel and this sand was pretty soggy, right? Its moisture content was much higher than the moisture content at SSD. So we need to do a moisture correction at the end. Okay, so has everybody got this? Is there, are there any questions? Okay. So a moisture correction. Okay. Oh, we're making wonderful time. All right. So let's take a look at this. All right. Um, I'll draw myself out a big table. Okay, gravel and sand, okay, and we're still, we're still looking at one cubic yard, okay? So, help me out, what do we have? This was, if we're looking at the weight, this was 1982.88, uh, and this was 951.88. Okay. Now, first thing I want to do is, look, we're talking about 19, you know, almost 2,000 pounds of gravel, okay? Now, if that gravel was in the saturated surface dry condition, you would agree that the pores would be filled with water, right? That means there's going to be some water already in that gravel if it was at the saturated surface dry condition. So let's look at saturated surface dry. So the first thing I want to see is the absorptions. Now you all remember how to do this. We, we've, already, we've already looked at that in, in the lab. So we'll say you know, this is SSD. Okay, so what was the absorption um, for the gravel and the sand? Does there, anybody remember these values? 0 0.51 and what? 0 0.9, okay? If you're a little rusty, that came from right here. So for the coarse aggregate, our uh, absorption was 0.51, and then uh, fine aggregate, 0.9. So 0 0.51, 0 0.9. Okay? So let's determine the weight of the water at the saturated surface dry condition. Yes, sir? 9.8. Thank you. See, I didn't draw the line below it, so it's not boxed in. I've always got a way out of it. Okay. All right. So in order to determine the weight of water, we're going to take this and multiply it by that, but it's a percentage. So if, if I just multiplied it, I'd get like, you know, 900 some pounds. There's not 900 some pounds in the water because it's 0.51%. So this times that and then divided by 100, tell me what do you get? Does that make sense? Oh, oh my, hold on. The tip just came out of this pen. Uh oh. Okay, well, it still works. Ten point one one. Okay, all right, all right. Everybody okay with this? So, I propose that at the saturated surface dry condition, there's about, what, 18 point some pounds of water already in the, the, the mix, okay? Now, when we did all of those, you know, water calculations and used all of those tables, all of those tables assumed that the weight of water that was used to hydrate 
uh, the concrete or hydrate the cement was water that was in excess uh, of the saturated surface dry condition. How much water is actually present in its current condition? Let's look at its existing condition. So let's look at existing. Okay, so what is its water content in its existing state? Say it again. I don't need the percent, that's redundant. 4.50? Okay. Any questions? All right, so now tell me what's the weight of water in its existing state? Okay. Is there a second on that? Yes. Good. Awesome. Pen tip is actually coming by. Okay. So would you agree, would you agree that, that there's excess water in the mix? Because the aggregate that we're using, the lack, for lack of a better term, the, the water that we're using is a little on the soggy side. Make sense? Okay. So how much? Okay. What's the, what's the, the, the change in water? Okay. Okay. So sum those up and tell me what you get. It'll be positive. 57 point six seven pounds. Okay. Everybody okay with that? All right. Now, what I'm going to call that is, is I'm going to call that the weight I'm going to call that the correction weight, the, the weight of the correction. Now, let me ask you this. That value came out positive because we have excess moisture. Okay? There's too much water in the aggregate. It is very possible. Now, let's look at the flip side. If I had to bet money, the aggregate that's in the lab over there, the aggregate that's in the lab, I'm going to say it's too dry. I'm going to say that not all the voids are filled. Because of that, I bet you if we did this for the aggregate in the lab, we'd probably get a negative answer. Because it has negative free moisture. And that is possible from our celebration of learning. <laughs> Told you this stuff would turn up. My goodness. Everybody okay with this? Okay. So I propose that our corrected weight of water, whoop, getting ahead of myself. Is the weight of the water minus the weight of the correction. And the nice thing about this formula is it works either way, okay? Because if you, if you need more moisture, you're just subtracting a negative number, so you get a positive answer. Do you see what I mean? Everybody okay with that? So that is what? It's, um, what was this? This was 275 minus 217.33. Everybody okay with that? It, yeah, it's still pounds per cubic yards. We are, again, doing these calculations for one cubic yard. 
I'd have to put per cubic yard, put per cubic yard everywhere, and I'm I'm lazy. Now, I think I'm trying to see. Did I include a, a slide that? Um, did I? No, I didn't. No, I thought I had a slide that had the answer on it. I'm sorry. I thought I had a slide. Oh well. Okay. Um, the only thing left to do is we've done a moisture correction for uh, the water. We have to do one final correction for the aggregate. Okay. The reason why is because the specific gravities that we assume in all those tables are saturated surface dry specific gravities. But the weights that are assumed in all those tables, the weights are dry unit weights. Okay. Because there is some moisture present inside our aggregate, we have to throw a little bit more aggregate into the mix to account for that differential. So the last thing that we have to do is we actually have to correct the weights of our gravel and our sand because all the design aids assume dry unit weights. So what I'm going to say is the weight of the gravel corrected is the weight of the gravel times one plus the water content. So basically long and short of it is, is if I have 1.69% water content, I'm bumping up the weight of the gravel 1.69%. So all, all I'm doing here is I'm taking 19, oh, get ahead of myself again. I'm taking 1982.88 pounds and I'm multiplying it times one plus, and then instead of one point, since it's a percent, I'm going to say 0 0.0169. Does everybody see how I'm doing that? I'm using the existing water content, the, ex the water content as it exists right now. Okay, and what do I get? Say it again. to zero one six point three nine you say do I have a second on that okay and then we'll do the same thing for the sand and I'm just going to write the the numbers out so that's nine fifty one point ninety eight one plus zero point zero four five oh and that's what 994.82. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Then therefore, for one cubic yard, gravel use we'll just say 2,016 pounds, sand use 995 pounds, cement use 625, was that it? Was it I can't remember, was it 625 pounds of cement? Okay, water use 217 pounds, and our admixture how many fluid ounces? I don't remember. 3.75 fluid ounces. There you go. Yes, sir. You'd be, you, you would be uh, surprised. I mean, a lot of this stuff is, is computer controlled. And you kind of need a little bit of an exact answer here. Because, I mean, they are going to take this. And what if they've got, you know, 100 cubic yards or 1,000? So you kind of need to be, you kind of need to have something somewhat exact so that you can bump it up and have a reasonable degree of accuracy for larger mixes. So I, I'd say any, to the nearest pound for this is fine for one cubic yard. 
What do you think? It's long, but it's not hard, is it? That is a very fundamental skill that you have learned. It's, it's like one of the boxes you can check off you know, for being a civil engineer. You can do a concrete mix design. And that's all we got. Um, we'll meet at, uh, here in 15 minutes and talk about lab and mix some concrete up. Sound good? All right. See you in a little bit.